Hello everyone and uh, welcome to our online lecture series on mobility analysis and planning for human scale cities. And we are sorry for the uh, interruption or, or the delay in the start, uh, but we will still have our time and uh, happily uh, listen to our today's guest's lecture and have uh, a discussion after the lecture with all of you. So this uh, lecture series is organized by the Mobility Lab at the University of Tartu. And this is already the third year we organized this event. Uh, and this year we are now today in our fourth lecture, uh, which will be held by uh, Associate Professor Andres Serchuk from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, Andres is an Associate Professor of Urban Science and Planning, and he's the head of the City Design and Development Group. At the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT, he also leads the City Forum Lab. His research focuses on public qualities of cities and on making urban environments more walkable, sustainable and equitable, bridging the fields of urban design, spatial analytics and mobility research. Andres is the author of the Urban Network Analysis Toolbox and has published two books. He has collaborated with a number of city governments, international organizations, planning practitioners and developers on urban designs, plans and policies in both developed and rapidly developing urban environments from across the globe. He has led various international research projects, published in planning, transportation and urban design journals and received numerous awards for his work. In his today's talk, entitled Modeling Pedestrian Activities in Cities, he will introduce us his and his team's work on pedestrian networks and modeling their uh, walking behavior in the New York City. And also he will talk about the benefits of such analysis for spatial planning. Now, Andres, welcome to our lecture series. We are most happy to have you uh, join us here today. And uh, now the floor is yours. We're all happy to hear your talk. Welcome. Thank you very much, Age. Um, well, thank you first for this very kind invitation to present the work on pedestrian modeling in New York. Um, it's really a pleasure. Um, and I'll use this as an example of a project that we've been working on over the last year and a half or so in conjunction with the uh, Department of Transportation and Department of City Planning in New York. Um, and in my research group at MIT, we have uh, similar collaborations actually with a couple of other uh, agencies where we try to support a municipal or state government sometimes in um, preparing uh, both data sets and models that would more accurately describe uh, the pedestrian realm for their own constituent areas. I'll start with a few motivations why we're interested in doing this work. There's a whole lot of attention on decarbonizing cities these days for very important reasons. It's an urgent task since uh, the human built environment is really responsible for the vast majority of both energy consumption and CO2 emissions in cities. And in places like MIT, uh, all too often the response that we see to the efforts to decarbonizing cities and in particular to decarbonizing urban mobility is a technology of some sorts. Um, most recently, these technologies involve electric vehicles, automated vehicles, transportation network companies like Uber, Lyft, or Taxify. And I personally am quite critical of these approaches and do not believe that we will dig ourselves out of the uh, sustainability trap by uh, investing into yet another round of automotive infrastructures. Um, and also, as you see on this little chart on the right, um, so far these technologies inevitably contribute to the high, highest income bracket of users who can afford the technology implementation and adoption. And in my research group, we are um, equally concerned as urban planners, not by a narrow uh, tunnel view of decarbonizing a sector or in particular decarbonizing tailpipe emissions, but we're also equally in interested in decarbonizing the built environment in general, 
including buildings, not just the mobility sector. We're also concerned with the equity implications of these policy shifts, the public health implications, economic development impacts thereof. How do these different um, policy changes and planning strategies in cities affect economic development and also the social dimensions of it? In my group, we are much more interested in these cross-sectoral solutions that are not addressing one narrow problem at a time, such as tailpipe emissions, but rather focus on a more holistic shift in the kinds of built environments that we build. And in particular, we're interested in built environment the planning and design that results in more walkable and transit-oriented environments. And I think this is truly also an equity strategy where um, the environments that do not rely on private mobility to the extent um, uh, we have in the 20th century uh, also uh, cater more holistically to different kinds of users at all income levels, genders, abilities, and ages. So I see the transition uh, to a more sustainable built environment entirely as an urban design and planning question, not as a technology development for a particularly new engine types or fuel types, but rather a question of designing cities entirely differently. So I'm going to give a little background to the study in New York, where we um, have modeled uh, pedestrian trips uh, in the city and actually continue to do so as the pro project is still a work in progress. So why do we model pedestrian trips in cities? Several cities have counted pedestrians at particular locations to understand how many people actually go about on foot, whether through pedestrian travel surveys or through on-street pedestrian counts. And typically those counts are sourced from a, um, a few locations, but they're lacking from most city streets. Therefore, a model can really help us understand and uh, extrapolate these uh, counted volumes to many other city streets and provide more comprehensive district or citywide volume estimates. This can be really important for allocating city resources, taxpayer resources to locations where they matter most, to places that impact the most constituents. And in addition, as I will show, the pedestrian volume data can also be an important denominator for various hazard data, such as traffic crashes, exposure to urban heat, noise, air pollution, and so forth. And finally, and perhaps most ambitiously, such a model can help us forecast how future changes in development permitting or, or planning permitting can help us understand how such plans, if realized, will impact non-motorized trips in the city. Now, a few words about New York City as a particular case. New York is a, a rather unusual city in the United States uh, due to its urban form that largely predates the automobile and its extreme densities, uh, particularly famously on Manhattan Island, but also in all the five boroughs of the city, including the Bronx, the Queens, uh, Brooklyn, um, as well as uh, parts of Staten Island. Walking is the most common mode of mobility for New Yorkers. 41% um, of all trips are conducted on foot in New York City, followed by 28% on vehicles, 16% by subway and 8% by bus. So it's the predominant and the most important way of getting around. And if you look at actually breaking this down by income to understand who walks in New York City, then we see an interesting kind of U-shaped distribution of um, cumulative walking. Um, lower income groups of people um, are uh, among the most likely walkers in the city. They have fewer automobiles and families, depend more on public transportation and get around more on foot. Public transportation and walking always go hand in hand for obvious reasons. Then as we get into the middle categories, um, walking, um, uh, percent as mode share uh, starts diminishing and the lowest mode shares is actually between the households making around $75,000 to $100,000 a year and $100,000 to $2,000 a year. And then the chart actually uh, reverts upward again in among the more high income families in New York. 
Uh, this is largely because uh, these uh, highest income families can afford to live in the most walkable parts of the city, in places that have lots of pedestrian destinations, good public transit connections, and high quality sidewalks near their homes. If we also look at how walking as a mode share is distributed, uh, in fact, this chart here shows um, uh, sustainable modes, not only walking, but also public transportation and biking. If we look at the distribution of those by area of city, uh, then they are uh, pretty high in most parts of the city, except uh, on the bottom of the chart, Staten Island, which is really an island connected by a bridge uh, close to the Statue of Liberty and uh, the least dense part of the city. Uh, and much of it is actually a landfill uh, where New York City's trash collection um, has been dumped for, for many decades. Um, here's the chart uh, on the right that shows a uh, walking mode chair. Um, and that is uh, uh, highest in the highest density parts of the city. So you see 53 and 54% in Manhattan, uh, the Bronx in the north, um, and 49% uh, in uh, parts of Brooklyn, and, and it drops as we go further away from the historic core of the city and the densities uh, diminish. It's interesting to also examine what mode chairs we see in New York City by trip purpose. So where do people walk the most for which kinds of trips? And also on this chart, you see where they use other ways of getting around um, than walking. So uh, a lot of walking trips, um, a whole 41% are related to homes as origins or destinations, um, uh, notably a lower share to workplaces. Most people in large cities cannot afford to live close to their jobs and therefore uh, end up taking public transport or driving there. And if they take public transport, um, they just walk the last segment of the trip. Uh, trips to schools are particularly high on walking mode share. A whole 58% of all those trips uh, take place on walking. Um, and also uh, shopping, eating, social recreational types of journeys and errands types of journeys are all over 40% um, mode share by walking. This speaks, I think, to the uh, highly walkable structure of New York City that has, through its densities, provided a lot of destinations uh, close by in most parts of the city. Um, and if we plot specifically uh, the walking trips by destination purpose here on the right, um, then the most uh, common walking trip is to run errands or or go to retail stores of all various kinds for care trips for personal uh trips um family related trips and then uh walking around um, home locations to social recreational destinations and so forth however despite the very large share of walking trips in new york city and as a whole the um sustainable trips that include transit, walking, and micromobility, micro -mobility, including cycling, uh, which constitute around 70% of all journeys in New York, the way that space is allocated in New York City does not represent that share. In fact, it's almost the opposite proportion. 76% of all space in the public realm of the city on the public rights of way of streets is dedicated to driving and only 24% of the city's space is dedicated to this sustainable mode. So there's been a strong realization by city government that something needs to be done about this. And over the last um, 10, 15 years, we have witnessed uh, fairly aggressive policies starting from Mayor Bloomberg's administration and then carried forward by subsequent mayors to reallocate New York City space. So in this work, we uh, follow this uh, workload depicted on the chart here. We, are, we built the pedestrian model for New York City, first by assembling a lot of data on New York, then producing preliminary pedestrian flow estimates on this data, uh, then calibrating the model on actual observed pedestrian counts in New York City, and finally ending up with a um, final calibrated uh, map and data set of pedestrian activity along city streets of New York. 
First, to collect data in New York, uh, the land use and built environment data that describes the origins and destinations of pedestrian movement um, was pretty easy to get for New York City. It's pretty well documented and there's, there are great public repositories for this data available. We know uh, at a pretty fine grain level, the population distribution where people's homes are, we know at the address point level where people's jobs are, uh, we know where transit stations like um, uh, metro stations are, even to the precision of individual exits from the metro stations, even bus stops, uh, parks, schools, and so forth. The biggest hurdle, however, for data collection was piecing together a data set of pedestrian of a pedestrian network for all of New York. There is some existing data on walkways for New York City that we received from the New York DOT. It's called the Planimetric uh, Pedestrian Network data set. Uh, and that's illustrated in for a small part of the city in the Bronx on the right hand side or left hand side in the red representation here. As you can see, a lot of sidewalks and even park paths are represented, but in a very fragmentary manner. If you wanted to use this data to route pedestrian trips, it is not made for that and it is not ready for that. So we engaged in a rather long and tedious exercise of cleaning this data through both automated cleaning uh, processes and through additional manual cleaning to make sure that this data represents accurately what's on the ground for pedestrians, sidewalks, crosswalks, footpaths in city parks and so forth, and that it is topologically interconnected and routable um, as illustrated on the right-hand side. The typical problems that occurred uh, in the raw data were uh, floating line segments that are disconnected from their uh, neighboring lines, uh, very complex intersection nodes where uh, too many nodes and edges intersect that uh, ought to be simplified, uh, missing nodes where two lines intersect without sharing endpoints, which is a problem for routability. Uh, lines have to intersect and share endpoints. In other words, be broken up at intersections to be able to route them. Uh, and I mentioned already these not intersections that are uh, can be really complicated. So there was um, a lot of work that went into this. And in fact, this is an ongoing research problem as we uh, are hoping to scale pedestrian and cycling network data sets for cities around the world it is important to streamline and automate these processes that can operate at scale. Um, it's something that humans can do very well, but um, training algorithms to do this has turned out to be more complex than we thought. There's a whole lot of common sense knowledge that humans use for background decision-making in cleaning these networks that are not uh, uh, easy to code into algorithmic processes. As I mentioned already, the trip origin destinations for residents, jobs, business amenities, schools, open spaces, metro stations, and so forth was uh, relatively easier to source from New York City. And for residents, we used uh, census blocks, which are usually one city block at a time. And we divided the census block counts into the frontages they have. So if it's a four-sided uh, city block, we basically represent it as four uh, dots uh, where trips can start or end uh, towards each front of the block on, on each street that the block faces. The flows themselves were modeled um, using the urban network analysis tools that Ake already mentioned. Um, these tools are currently available as a plugin for Rhino 3D uh, for a more graphic interface and suitable for uh, physical planners and urban designers who might want to model pedestrian flows as part of new development proposals and plans and most recently also available as an open source and free Python package or library called Madina that we released just last month uh, publicly. Uh, it's available on GitHub and there is extensive documentation um, on read the docs to illustrate how the different tools in Madina work and use the urban network analysis framework to model pedestrian uh, and cycling journeys through cities. So I'll briefly run through an illustration of this um, using a simple case to start. So here I have one city block uh, that has been divided into four frontages. These blue dots represent four sides of the city block where we have a population count. And we are routing trips uh, from that city block to one subway station 
But that one subway station happens to have two separate entrances on both sides of the 176th Street. So when journeys are routed this way, they do not take the shortest route. They, in fact, use all routes that are up to a certain percentage longer than the shortest routes to represent idiosyncrasies in pedestrian route choice preferences. Um, and there's a destination choice model that prefers closer destinations or more attractive destinations. So more trips are routed to the closer destinations typically um, or, or destinations that have a higher weight uh, or higher uh, indicator of attractiveness. Um, and if we expand this to more stations that are within a reasonable walkshed around this city block, then the destination choice model here breaks the probabilities up uh, by uh, accessibility of destinations. Again, that accessibility depends both on proximity and attractiveness of the stations. And as you go further and further, the stations that are far away start getting um, a fewer trips. And if we further scale this up to all uh, subway stations in New York City and all city blocks in New York City, uh, we get um, the uh, estimated distribution of uh, pedestrian flows for that one particular trip type, from just the trip from homes to subway entrances uh, uh, amongst all city blocks in New York. You can zoom into parts of uh, Manhattan here and get an estimate for a very specific uh, sidewalks, crosswalks, or um, footpaths throughout the city. Um, we then uh, proceeded to estimate these types of trips for many trips types, not just homes to subways, but trips between homes to jobs, homes to bus stops, or homes to uh, schools, parks, institutions, uh, cultural establishments, amenities, and uh, a, a large matrix of different trip types. In Medina, these can all be automated by feeding in what's called the pairing table, shown on the bottom of the slide here, where we can uh, designate the kinds of origins that are available as individual data layers, um, GeoJSON files usually, and then the destination types. And we also have to include certain variables that go into these models. And then um, Marina will proceed to estimate the um, uh, distribution of these trips uh, in an automated manner. Um, so I'll further reflect briefly on some of the assumptions. When trips are routed from any origin to any destinations, we can input uh, a desired distance decay rate which penalizes distance and, in other words, makes the probability of walking less if people have to cover more distance. Uh, second, we do not assume shortest routes, but uh, can, in, in fact, find all routes that are up to a certain percent longer than shortest routes because very often people do not actually walk the shortest routes in the city. Uh, it's possible to also account for street characteristics in this routing exercise. Uh, we then operate with what we call perceived distances rather than geometric distances on network segments. And these perceived distances can account for things like sidewalk dimensions, traffic volume, street cover, the presence of pleasant amenities, and other positive and negative attributes of routes. And um, all of these attributes uh, will impact the perception of walking distance, uh, which can be modeled and included um, in such routing. Uh, pedestrian route choice literature is the right place to um, uh, source the effects of these negative and positive street attributes on willingness to walk and on the perceived segment distances. Here's just an example of a table from one study uh, where we compared uh, pedestrian route choice coefficients uh, or particularly what we call willingness to walk ratios uh, in Boston and uh, San Francisco. These willingness to walk ratios here uh, illustrate the distance equivalent effects of different street attributes. So for instance, in San Francisco, walking uphill um, in elevation gain, each meter of uphill elevation gain is perceived as equivalent to the walk being uh, or feeling like 3.8 meters longer. So that's a negative that people try to avoid. However, walking past amenities on city streets like ground floor facing businesses, restaurants, um, and service establishments is positive. So passing an extra 10 amenities is perceived as equivalent to the walk feeling like 18 meters uh, shorter. So it increases the willingness to walk by 18 meters. Uh, however, in New York, actually, we don't have that uh, data in the model yet. We're working on that uh, with the city actively, um, but the way it would feel uh, feed into the model in the future is if a particular street has uh, better properties for pedestrians like the street highlighted in this uh, 
black buffered segments um, here, then the routing algorithm will be able to read that and prioritize lowest cost routes and therefore the distribution of routes will scatter around these um, preferred routes. Um, next, in terms of destination choice, we use a particular model called the Huff model for destination choice. Um, very often for modeling pedestrian trips, uh, you have many optional destinations around each origin. If you consider, for instance, bus stops from a particular origin building, there may be uh, 10 or more bus stops one can walk to reasonably uh, in a short time span. Uh, what we do is the Huff model basically measures the gravity accessibility of each of these destinations and then finds the probability of each specific destination as the ratio of that destination's probability divided by uh, all destinations probabilities that are within uh, a given walking range. So in other words, closer destinations and again, more attractive destinations obtain higher probabilities. With these assumptions in place, we can then estimate trips citywide from all residential origins and uh, job locations and schools and public transit stations, et cetera, uh, to various kinds of destinations. So I'll flip through some of them. These are trips between amenities from shops to shops and services to services kinds of trips. These are trips from homes to amenities. These are trips from homes to jobs uh, that are within an 800 or half a mile, 800 meter or half a mile walk radius around homes. Uh, trips from homes to metro stations, trips from homes to green areas and parks, trips from homes to school locations, trips from jobs to business uh, amenities like restaurant services, retailers and so forth, trips starting from jobs and going to metro stations. As you can see, there's a very high concentrations of jobs in, in Midtown Manhattan and Lower Manhattan where these uh, highlights are shown and uh, trips uh, between metro stations and parks in the city. However, all of these models and trip estimates so far still reflect just estimates. Uh, the number of trips allocated from every home location corresponds to the population census at that location. So a trip is allocated for every resident or every job uh, uh, at a given location. And the relative importance of different destinations uh, corresponds to its attributes. The next step in the process is to calibrate these estimates on actual pedestrian counts on city streets so as to adjust them uh, collectively to reflect the actual distribution of pedestrian flows at the counted locations where counts are available. In New York City, uh, we operated with a total of uh, 1,068 count locations that New York DOT had available. Um, they had uh, 1,000 locations or 1,010 locations where morning uh, peak period counts were available for 8, and not, eight to 9 p.m. 8 and 9 to a.m. counts, 346 locations for lunch counts, and over a thousand again for um, evening peak hour counts. And um, a notably lower number of counts were available during the weekday weekends. Uh, a, a total number of locations where counts occurred in the weekends uh, was 459. These were collected from 2018 to 2019 period, which is also corresponding to the model data sets that we used to estimate pedestrian flows. So effectively, you, we use this count data as the ground truth that we try to explain with the estimated flows and uh, use statistical modeling to uh, put a coefficients and estimated values in front of each type of pedestrian flow so that we better uh, or best match the actual observed distribution of flows at the count locations. Here are the calibration results. Um, we used different kinds of model fitting techniques and ultimately uh, settled on machine learning models to fit this data. Uh, and here on the top of this chart, we report the weekday um, uh, modeling results and on the bottom in blue, the weekend modeling results for the different time periods. First column is AM peak, uh, then the lunch in the middle and the PM peak on the right. Uh, usually for uh, fitting these models, we do a five-fold average cross-validation technique where we basically train the model on 80% of the data 
and test the predictive accuracy on 20% of the data that the model hasn't seen. And then we repeat this process uh, five times with random uh, uh, samples and uh, use the uh, fivefold average uh, cross validation to report the R squared values uh, in the table here. Uh, the model that best fit um, on in the morning peak periods was the random forest model uh, with 67% predictive accuracy. The fitting accuracy was 95%, but that's um, really because these models can overfit. So actually, uh, the predictive accuracy is more meaningful here. Uh, in the lunch period, 71% R squared, and in the evening period, 73%, uh, and somewhat lower values on week ends. Uh, just to also compare how this uh, compares to more traditional lin uh, linear regression techniques to fit these models, um, the machine learning model was picked particularly because it achieves a uh, higher accuracy. So uh, both in, in training and particularly in testing on unseen samples, the machine learning model uh, does a better job uh, predicting uh, accurately the um, pedestrian volumes on uh, the counted segments. We can break this down into also what's called variable importances. Uh, this basically describes how much each type of pedestrian trip type or flow contributes to the R score value during the different peak periods. So for instance, in the morning peak period, uh, it's really the walking trips between job locations and metro stations that dominate New York City, followed by jobs and amenities and so forth. And in the lunch time, it's really the trips between jobs and business amenities on city streets, like the retail, food, and service businesses that dominate. And it's a different picture in the evening period. And again, uh, same can be done for weekend uh, distributions. Uh, this also illustrates that one of the advantages of using machine learning models for this is that uh, the relationships can be nonlinear. Um, uh, since they don't always rise or fall in uh, strictly uh, linear trends, and we actually see that uh, happening for different kinds of uh, trips. And a second important uh, reason for machine learning models is that they get around uh, multicollinearity in regression models very well. Uh, in linear regression models, tra traditional OLS types of regression models, there is an assumption that different independent variables are independent of each other. Uh, however, in uh, traffic uh, flow or pedestrian flow modeling, uh, they're bound to be correlated with each other. So trips from homes to subway stations are bound to be highly correlated with trips from homes to bus stops, for example. And that's a problem for OLS models, uh, which machine learning models can uh, elegantly get around. So having calibrated this uh, model, we then arrive finally at predicted calibrated pedestrian volume estimates for each street in the city. Here we sh I show the weekday AM, lunch, and PM pairs. These include a dozen different kinds of pedestrian trip types underneath them, and each of these trip types has been calibrated vis-a-vis -vis the observed data uh, and uh, is now uh, accurately uh, reflecting the actual observed pedestrian counts at these 1,000 calibration locations. However, the model is not restricted to those locations. It then expands or extrapolates the estimates for all streets throughout New York City. We can zoom into particular locations, and the yellow labels here illustrate the estimated pedestrian uh, flow uh, for the weekday morning in this case and the blue labels illustrate the actual counts of pedestrians at the same locations. And we can do the same for weekends uh, and zoom into particular locations. Uh, as you can see, for instance, in the segment here, the actual flow was 734, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 910, and the model estimated 734 people per hour for this crosswalk uh, in uh, lower Manhattan or this one, uh, actual flow was 1,777, model estimate was 1,635. So not exactly on, but a very good estimate. Uh, and overall, um, I don't have this slide here, unfortunately, to show uh, the, uh, for all peak periods for the morning AM, lunch and PM, or sorry, for the weekday AM, lunch and PM, and also for the weekend, AM, lunch, and PM periods, the correlations 
at the 1,000 locations on weekdays and, and the 495 locations on weekends were all over 90% uh, when comparing estimated and uh, actual pedestrian uh, volumes. Finally, I wanted to illustrate a case uh, how this data can be really useful already for uh, policymaking and decision making in New York. Um, this, this chart here illustrates um, pedestrian crashes in parts of New York uh, where we had the data digitized. The black dots illustrate locations where vehicles had crashed into pedestrians, injuring them, and the red ones are more tragic locations where pedestrians had been killed in uh, those areas. Very often, city governments will use such crash data to highlight the most dangerous intersections. So here on the left, I show the 100 worst intersections in New York in terms of raw pedestrian counts, where pedestrians were injured. And some of these red dots had over 25 pedestrian crashes in this 10-year period. In general, in the US, if a pedestrian, if an inter-traffic inter intersection has had more than three pedestrian crashes over the last 10 year period, it's considered highly dangerous. So those are highly dangerous intersections throughout the city, all of these 100 mapped here. However, you can also see that the concentration of crashes is particularly focused on Midtown Manhattan. And if you know something about New York, you probably already suspect that that's probably where you also have the highest pedestrian volumes. So what if we were to normalize these raw pedestrian crashes with the modeled or estimated pedestrian volumes at the locations, then couldn't we uh, get around the high volume bias and in fact illustrate where pedestrian crash probabilities are highest rather than the raw volumes? And that's precisely what I show here on the right hand side. I've taken this pedestrian crash data on the left and divided it through by the estimated volumes of pedestrians at the same locations. And what's interesting about it is that the focus shifts out of Midtown Manhattan. It shifts to places like the Bronx, which is a traditionally uh, black neighborhood um, and uh, has received historically much fewer investments into quality streets or safer crossings or even into public transit than Manhattan has. And that's precisely where the probability of getting hit by a car is highest for pedestrians. Or places like Queens, uh, Jackson Heights in uh, Eastern Brooklyn and other areas of the city that are away from Manhattan. Um, and this is an interesting philosophical question of where should a city government invest the scarce taxpayer uh, funds to improve uh, intersection safety? Is it at locations where the raw crashes are highest in number, or is it in places where the probability of getting hit uh, is highest? Finally, I'll finish by illustrating another implementation or aspect of this model, which uses the model to forecast how new developments will impact pedestrian journeys around them and uh, desirably allow city governments to permit and encourage new developments at locations that actually increase the pedestrian mode share in cities. In most industrialized nations, when you do large scale developments, developers will have to do what's called environmental review. Um, and an important aspect of that is traffic impact assessment. So they will effectively have to study how the proposed new development will change vehicular traffic on the streets around it. And the law requires that if the estimated traffic impacts exceed what is called the level of service of these roadways, then the developer will have to pay uh, for adjustments or mitigation measures, such as pay for new turning lanes, pay for road widening in front of their projects, pay for signal readjustments, new parking provisions, and so forth. So one of the promising applications of this model is to be able to simplify and scale up pedestrian impact assessments of such development projects rather than traffic impact. To do a calibrated model for a city, like I showed for New York, and then to input new developments into this model as new data points, or to change the properties of street segments in the, in the model, and then use that after scenario to estimate how pedestrian trips will have changed as a result of the developments. 
This could lead to very different kinds of mitigation measures. It could lead to cities asking developers to help us instead pay for sidewalk widening for pedestrians rather than vehicles, for public space investments, for safer crossings for all ages and abilities, for signal readjustments and so forth. And not only in front of their own projects, but in the impact areas neighborhood wide in their respective uh, catchment areas. It's ultimately possible to do this sort of a model in a um, browser-based software environment where one doesn't even have to do a specific study for a specific site, but could have such a calibrated pedestrian flow model already available online and allow uh, both city workers and any interested um, parties to uh, enter the model uh, and try out different scenarios by overriding the uh, properties of individual buildings, their densities, their sizes, or also the properties of street segments in terms of their pedestrian characteristics, and then calculate the impact and be able to estimate how that affects uh, pedestrian uh, trip distributions around them, and ideally uh, leading to more non-motorized trips in cities. I'll just finish by um, acknowledging my uh, wonderful research team uh, who has been part of this project in various aspects um, and uh, who continue to do great work uh, uh, pushing the boundaries of pedestrian modeling um, and uh, implementing this work uh, in cities around the US and also around the world now. Um, and we'll open up for questions and comments. Great, thank you, Andres, so much for this uh, very interesting and, and such a like, practical and useful approach for our uh, contemporary cities and future cities. Uh, thanks for introducing it. Uh, now we are indeed open. Now we open up the, the round for questions uh, and discussion. So please also all who you are watching us over web, uh, they, there is this Q and A section, and you are very welcome to use that. Uh, but here first question from our audience. So there was mention of uh, the 70% uh, child is walking and 76% is for drivers and then there's some like hope for uh, like policy change or something for that and I was interested in what are the changes or how the space how what are the changes that are being used to change the space be used yeah uh, that's a great question um, so New York City has really been one of the leaders in this movement to design new street design guidelines. You, you may have come across the different uh, um, guideline books that are now widely available for cities around the world. Uh, they were originally popularized by the organization called NACTO, the North American City Transportation Officials Organization. Uh, and many cities have developed their own street design guidelines. A lot of that work originated from New York. And they have been repurposing and reallocating street, pay, street space more for pedestrians, doing safer uh, intersections, and also allocating more space for bikes and public transportation. Particularly during the Bloomberg period in New York, uh, literally hundreds of mini plazas were created around New York City uh, at street corners where space was dedicated originally for large turning radiuses for cars. It was originally taken away as micro public spaces through cheap interventions like paint and bollards and planters. And some of those plazas were famously then converted to permanent uh, pedestrian spaces. Most famous of those perhaps is the Times Square conversion, which used to be a kind of traffic uh, uh, intersection and now is a giant public space um, in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, more smaller uh, or smaller versions of that have been taking place all throughout the city in all boroughs, frankly. Um, and uh, I would just, really emphasize that that um, realization that the the street space of a city is any city's largest public space over a half of a city is usually in the public right away of the street and in the 20th century it was almost unquestionably given away to traffic and slither of sidewalks retained on both sides many cities have come to realize that this is the greatest opportunity for public space they have is to reallocate that space and new york has really uh, led the way on this yeah, excellent examples and i'm sure this, uh, this this has proven to be a great example and encouragement for uh, cities around the world including our uh, small doctor here 
more questions from the audience again. I'm quite happy about the game and it, um, it seems that uh, it's quite high um, walking table in New York City and I'm start to uh, ask about it. How and when did uh, the habit of walking in New York begin? Did traffic uh, congestion initially drive people uh, to walk more or uh, was it the development of uh, like pedestrian areas uh, that caused uh, Aga, do you mind uh, reiterating? I had a little trouble hearing the question. Uh, uh, I would like to ask how and when uh, did the habit of uh, walking uh, in uh, New York City uh, begin? So when people began to to walk in the in the New York City, so or whether it drops in between and then. Uh, when New York City as a city took deliberately the way to be a pedestrian, a walking city? Well, I, I guess from its outset, uh, since it was originally a Dutch colony and then an English colony, uh, up until uh, really the rise of the automobile, which took over starting around 1910, it has always been built around pedestrians. It's really a 20th century story that it had allocated so much space away for automobiles. Um, and uh, it has come back to allocate space more to non-motorized users uh, since, um, I would say, around starting around 2005. Mm -hmm. and, and these policies have been aggressively pursued by all mayors uh, since then. And I think uh, we, we really uh, observe this trend uh, going global in, in many cities around Europe now, too, where aggressively mayors are repurposing uh, street space. And, and hopefully uh, with new city government in Tallinn uh, as well. Uh, I know Tartu has been doing uh, nice things over the years, uh, and but it's it's contentious um, and uh, it really does require, I believe, uh, strong leadership, uh, and it also requires strong uh, bottom-up uh, grassroots organizing to push these projects. Uh, both are necessary uh, to to um, lead to positive change, um, and we can see how. Uh, uh, failing to uh, act on some of these can can can. Uh, uh, shift the trend. And uh, I think Tartu is a good example where I think there has been periods with strong energy. And then sometimes when some of these energies wave, wane or, or relax, we see the kind of interest around automobility pushing back in. Uh, and uh, it's a constant uh, tug of war uh, to make sure the priorities uh, stay um, uh, on a more progressive side. Yeah, but related to, related to that question, uh, the the type of urban space that you are mostly working with is indeed walkable. It's dense. Uh, it has a lot of uh, workplaces uh, and, and other amenities squeezed into certain areas. But what about working with uh, suburban areas and and whether you have also experience in uh, modeling? scenarios so if sidewalks were different or if the street pattern was different or if you yeah. introduce new amenities so what about that yeah no uh, actually uh new york city is a bit of an anomaly uh in these studies because it's clearly the densest city in the united states uh or a densest large city at least um uh, but there is nothing in this framework that i presented there's nothing in this model that restricts it to dense places only it works perfectly fine for small towns and lower density environments uh, and all kinds of built conditions. Uh, at the root of the framework is an SCS, the realization and the um, assumption that mobility flows between places in the built environment are triggered by the land use structure of the city. Where origins and destinations lie, how far they are apart and how conveniently we can choose to get to them determines how people will move. So that's why you, you very often hear uh, people say that uh, transportation is derived demand. It's derived from land use patterns. It's derived from urban structure. It's not something that, uh, you know, uh, uh, policy can easily change if the land use structures incentivize particular kinds of mobility. And indeed, for small places and low density built environments, we can see it's just going to happen at a very different scale. We can see how interventions in land use change or improvements in street design, et cetera, all will lead to a shift in pedestrian mobility. It's just going to be at a different level. It's, it, it will have 
uh, a smaller overall or absolute impact than in a place like New York, where thousands or sometimes hundreds of thousands of people will directly benefit from a small intervention. Yeah, thanks. Then we have questions in our Q&A section. Um, Joanne Bias uh, has asked, do you have any plan to work on driving behavior analysis? No. I know that Andres and his team uh, is dedicated to work on accident mobility only, and as there are many groups in the world who work with driving, driving behavior, although they are, of course, uh, interconnected. I mean, and let me just qualify that no by saying uh, I think there's just been we don't work on driving behavior largely because there's just disproportionate amount of effort uh, that has already gone into this over the last many decades uh, where it perhaps connects to the work that I do and where we um, uh, will do some work is looking at how to reduce uh, the possibilities of uh, collisions and crashes uh, between uh, pedestrians and, and cars, uh, and uh, this this largely involves uh, physical interventions in street design that will slow traffic down and that will affect driver behavior. But uh, as a study of behavior, uh, we are not particularly uh, interested in focusing in driver behavior per se, but rather making conditions um, safer for mon non motorized street users. Yeah. And that's the big challenge in our mobility transitions across the globe. Uh, Elise Allen has asked um, how easy it is to collaborate with the public sector. How does the implementation of these effective tools work out? Um, New York City has been a really great partner for this. They've been very interested um, in the pedestrian model because uh, we saw from the data that it's the largest mode share in the city, so they really care about their pedestrians. They know it's the most important mode share. And in fact, it's the only city in the United States that I'm aware of that actually has a whole section of their DOT or the Department of Transportation dedicated to pedestrian mobility. They have what's called the pedestrian unit within their DOT. So uh, there's a t whole team of people interested in working on this on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we haven't uh, rolled out the model in New York into as an official tool for policy making quite yet. Uh, these uh, volume estimates citywide are re relatively new. And in fact, we are um, continuing to refine this model uh, for uh, various uh, policy relevant purposes. We'll have to see how the implementation turns out. Uh, I mean, we believe that by even just putting out the pedestrian network data into the open public domain and also the estimated pedestrian volumes that are calibrated on actual counts into the open public domain uh, would uh, lead to a lot of additional innovation and research work and also policy relevance. Um, uh, we'll have to see how that actually pans out. Um, we have been collaborating on this particular project both with DOT and DCP. Uh, DCP is the Department of City Planning and they have been quite interested in some of the street design interventions. They want to know questions like, if I uh, take away some parking spaces and allow street coffee shops or uh, or seating on the, on, on the roadway, or if I invest into um, uh, better public space treatments on this street, what's the likely impact? How could I justify it to my finance department? How could I quantify how many people will benefit from it uh, and so forth? So that's been so far uh, a key interest area for them. Yeah, thanks. Then there was a question about uh, the ask to repeat the name of the library uh, in GitHub, and it's uh, github.com slash city for lab slash Madina, and it's also put into, uh, into the chat, so, so we can uh, take it from there. But uh, as it is a, now this technical type of question, I also can uh, we continue with technical uh, questions a bit. So you talked about the, uh, the count, pedestrian count locations. Uh, which were like in 2000 and something located all together and in different um, during the different times you had different counters so first uh, why did the counters like differ temporarily so why, why didn't you have like continuous counters or did you like change the locations very like technical question but also then whether you um, counted the pedestrian volumes on street segments or also check, uh, junctions, so you knew where they are crossing, whether whether they are going directly or turning right and left, and so on. So, so please just a bit. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, the reason that the count locations differ is that these are uh, largely counted by human counters. They're not automated. And uh, the way that New York City conducts these counts is that uh, when they do a neighborhood study or a planning study for a particular corridor, or when private developers want to build things in different neighborhoods, the city asks that they conduct counts. So they re relatively haphazardly happen in different parts of the city, depending where these requests had been made. Uh, and uh, they can be uh, different. Um, and, and they don't always count all the six periods, uh, uh, weekday morning, lunch, evening, and weekend morning, lunch, evening. They sometimes only con uh, count morning and evening and so forth. So that's why the distribution looks as such. Um, uh, on the what they count, um, the vast majority of the counts are from junctions where they count four or more crossings. In fact, they usually don't count the segment. They usually count how many people cross a zebra crossing um, at intersection. So we get four counts per location or more. Sometimes it's eight or, or so. And, and some of the counts are for segments too. Uh, but uh, I think the intersections offer an opportunity to uh, sort of quantify uh, uh, eight different directional flows uh, in one go. In fact, they keep they keep track of the directionality of the flows as well, which is uh, potentially offers uh, even a more fine grained way of calibrating this model. Yeah. Okay, that's clarified. I see. Uh, have you been also working uh, with other type of uh, like um, real world data, so uh, GPS flows, mobile data flows, etc. Not only comps. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, the a lot of the model assumptions cannot be fine tuned on just the count data. Uh, the count data is pretty blunt and, and coarse uh, and just tells us how many people walk past locations. So it doesn't tell us a whole lot about pedestrian behavior per se. So the behavioral assumptions of these models are largely based on uh, the behavioral evidence uh, of people, people actually walking. So we work a lot with uh, GPS trace data of these things. So we, uh, in New York, there is a citywide uh, pedestrian or citywide travel survey that has uh, over 100,000 pedestrian GPS routes traced. Uh, and we actually, our research group recently implemented our own uh, mobility survey for the Boston region, where we had um, we recruited around 1,000 participants, uh, and uh, each one was uh, tracked for about five weeks. Um, and uh, obtained not just pedestrian, all modal traces. We used uh, an app that sort of automatically um, uh, designates modes, and then people can override and validate manually whether the auto detection was fine. And we use that data to study where people walk, what routes they choose, what affects their um, uh, mode choice probabilities, route choice probabilities, uh, and for different kinds of utilitarian walking, recreational walking, and so forth. All right, so have you also implemented uh, that work into this work you've uh, presented us today? Like, have you also used the, the information for, for your pedestrian modeling um, in New York? Uh, yes and no. So in general, what we've learned from these studies in other cities uh, is how the uh, distance decay coefficients affect walking probabilities, how uh, destination choice probability models uh, can be fine-tuned uh, according to pedestrian behavior, how trip distances vary by destination types and so forth. So all of this is sort of general knowledge we have learned from various other studies uh, outside of New York. In New York, that um, uh, detailed uh, GPS evidence or travel survey records have not been accessible uh, to us so far. Uh, we've been working on a data sharing agreement with the city uh, for a long time now, uh, and uh, I hear that it's coming very soon. So we're very much looking forward to fine tuning these assumptions specifically for New York. So far, we've been using assumptions calibrated from other cities on some of the route choice uh, questions and destination choice questions from places like Boston or San Francisco. Uh, but we are uh, getting finally access to the New York travel records, and that will allow very interesting questions to be asked. So, for instance, we will construct a uh, route choice model specifically for New York, which means that we can study how specific street attributes affect New Yorkers' route choice behavior. Like, are mm -hmm. they more likely to walk on routes that have, let's see, more dining venues on streets or less crowded streets or streets that have more greenery and so forth? And putting these findings into the New York model will allow the uh, predictive uh, 
capacity of the model to become a lot more interesting. So we can test things like if you renovate the streets and double the sidewalk width, what would happen specifically in New York based on their data? Okay, that is that is interesting. So how have you taken into consideration so far uh, the daylight conditions? Daylight? Yes, because people, I think they tend to behave differently, the pedestrians, whether they are more willing to walk in the, in the, during the daytime or during the nighttime. And, uh, you know, there, there starts to be different hairs and then perhaps uh, street greenery starts to be, starts to have another <laughs> nighttime. Et yeah. And this is dynamic throughout the year. It's not just, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I personally have not estimated the route choice preferences for, um, uh, uh, night and day conditions, uh, even though there's some literature suggesting, uh, yes, that we should absolutely have, uh, expect it to vary. And then in, in particular, I think there's going to be a gender difference in sensibility to lighting. Um, I, what we have done is uh, looked at seasonal variations and also weather variations. We have estimated how route choice preferences differ by uh, heat waves. Uh, in, in the Boston case, for instance, we have found that people do behave differently during a heat wave as pedestrians, and they will seek out routes that are more shaded uh, and cooler. And in fact, that would lead to really interesting policy implications because their willingness to walk decreases with heat waves. And that, I think, um, um, is a kind of a early warning that as on the one hand, cities try to encourage more walking and, and sustainable mode share as they develop, we also know that the climate is warming all throughout the world and that climate change trend will work against that direction. It will work against people's willingness to get out on foot or to bike outside. And, and we have to be therefore, I think even more aggressive with the street interventions that uh, encourage more active mobility uh, because 20 years from now, 40 years from now, conditions will be different and we have to account for that. So the, the tree canopies and other um, things that can help uh, mitigate um, heat waves, uh, I think maybe not so felt today, but they will be uh, in decades from now. Yeah, and, and the trees also take time to grow. So it's time to think about that So right now. So uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's for, for this your presentation. I think I have quite many <laughs> questions, but I think we don't have so much time. But, but one, uh, one question related a little with uh, August's uh, question that uh, about the different factors that uh, you have used in the model, not only the counts, that have you somehow uh, included or, or analyzed the different uh, the people or the differences between the, the social groups that who, who are the people who is walking on the all the all the variety of uh, you, you brought out the income but also for old or young or the I don't know in different characteristics have you somehow put these uh, characteristics to the models or have you thought about uh, to do it yeah absolutely um so this is an on very much an ongoing area of work in our group where we try to distinguish the uh, travel behavior preferences by demographic groups. And this was actually one of the key reasons why we uh, did the Boston Walks uh, travel survey um, uh, was to, we, we specifically collected the sa sample of 1000 respondents by groups uh, so that we have gender differences, income differences, ethnicity and race differences, age differences and car ownership differences in these groups uh, in order to understand how the uh, behaviors uh, vary across the groups uh, and incorporate those into the models. Um, in the New York example that I presented today, uh, we haven't had access to that data yet. Um, and we are very much also wanting to test how um, things like, um, what's when we estimate basically a, a coefficient or um, a function, for a particular trip type. Let's say we have trips from homes to subways. So far, the model is an average New Yorker. Uh, and what's the, the uh, coefficient or probability of somebody walking from homes to subway uh, around their house? Uh, 
My guess is that uh, this will vary by groups of people, depending on your car ownership in a family, depending on your income level, and it will vary by the kind of environment you live in. So both the demographics and the quality of the environment that you traverse on your trips will, will play into it. And that's something that we are very eager to uh, add and start in the New York case as well, um, as the data now becomes available uh, to distinguish the um, more uh, fine-grained behavioral records from travel service for New Yorkers, but we haven't been able to do that for New York yet. Okay, and, and the, the second question, this is uh, mostly the, the main what I had with the name is that uh, when is coming the models, when it's included all the different uh, mobility modes, that it is like the coherent uh, model for uh, including all this, because I, I see that uh, in la uh, last, as we had this last uh, presentation was more like this transportation modeling in one corner, and then it's more this sustainable mobility uh, researcher, like uh, you are doing this uh, walking, and, and the other corner is uh, we uh, studying the biking, and the model is like one mobility way based, but in sometimes the mostly, I think some, some people use the one mode, but but um, people choose the different modes, and it is also depending on the maybe the street that where the destination is, uh, which way I, I would uh, try to choose. That I see that also based on the research, but also the travel behavior. This is uh, I see that it is so much connected. This the different mobility that then it's the if it's also the modeling is uh, like in so separated then don't come together in the city or also in the, the thinking of all this mobility, like the one, one not the one way, but the, the, the how to choose it, not only to, to study one yeah. or the other, and to not to decrease the car, car usage or increasing the biking, but, the, but it's the way of thinking about this mobility, how you see that when it's coming to yeah. happen. Yeah, I mean, this has been a historic uh, issue because there are these uh, giant multimodal modeling platforms like, for instance, MIT has developed many of them over the past decades. Uh, the current one is Sim Mobility, that is a large multimodal platform. Um, then there's uh, uh, in Switzerland, Germany, uh, most people use the MatSim platform uh, for multimodal modeling. Uh, there's been uh, various efforts in Cambridge, England, or in Santiago, Chile, to develop these large multimodal models. Uh, generally, the multimodal models have, um, uh, they're really complicated to build, um, and they have paid uh, very little attention to the non-motorized modes. So their emphasis has been largely on vehicle and sometimes public transportation flows. Um, and then these sorts of pedestrian models that I present here, are very detailed on the pedestrian mode and uh, um, do not deal with all the different modal assignments. I think that the, the way to do it most constructively next is to um, use the mode share estimates from models like Matsim, uh, which based on uh, very complex trip, daily trip diaries uh, and tours, not just individual legs of trips, but daily trip diary tours, uh, will uh, determine mode share estimates for particular trips. And that's one of the key outputs of these models that say, okay, during the lunch period from this job location, uh, X percent of trips will go to lunch by car, X percent of trips will walk to lunch, X percent of trips will take transit to lunch and so forth. Um, and that's all based on the built environment condition around. I think that output, uh, that kind of mode share allocation uh, can be the input for a lot of these detailed ped and bike models. So we don't have to estimate that separately because that requires huge amounts of work to get to that point. Uh, and it's very complicated, uh, uh, in fact, to achieve, but we can sort of take something like a Matsim model up until that point where the motor allocations are computed. And then from there, uh, specifically model the modal distribution of these trips over the networks, whether they're walking trips, biking trips, and so forth. Uh, this is also something that's been on our radar for quite some times. Uh, usually 
the um, teams necessary to to build these really um, comprehensive land use transportation models that involve all modes uh, and uh, really accurately uh, try to depict uh, the distribution of uh, all all steps of the model from drip generation to a distribution mode choice and route assignment for all of that uh, requires a large multi disciplinary team, I think, and uh, we haven't uh, done much work. We've had this conversation many times uh, with different partners who have built these large mo models, whether at MIT or elsewhere. Um, and I, I think uh, it's, I don't, I don't see any major technical barriers to connecting them to that level of detail with computing power also increasing. Um, and I think it'll require a good large grant to just get this project going. <laughs> Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, our time is uh, running up. We now uh, run a bit later because we also started a bit later. But I see that there is one last question question from the audience. And uh, Shahid, I will open your microphone. So please, for a short question, short answer, there is this possibility to ask it now. Shahid. Your microphone is now open. You can use it. As you have raised your hand. Okay, and uh, if that now it didn't work out, then we also should have the question in the Q and A section. So, so we would like to uh, thank you, Andres, uh, very very much for this today's talk. Um, and before we end, uh, we still have uh, still introduce the next lecture uh, very briefly. So, in one week, um, we will have Professor Tauri Tuvikene from Tallinn University as our guest in, in this lecture series. Uh, and while we today talked more about uh, quantitative modeling and different uh, models, how to count uh, uh, pedestrian activity and also use these kind of tools in, in planning, the spatial planning processes, then next week, uh, our focus will shift more to qualitative methods and qualitative concepts. So, Tauri's uh, talk is entitled Sustainable Mobility Cultures, Inspirations from Qualitative Transport Research. And he argues that the movement towards a sustainable mobility paradigm needs attention to cultural aspects of transportation. So, we balance out the quantitative and qualitative approaches in mobility uh, and transport planning. Uh, with that, yeah, with that lecture. But now, uh, Andres, once more, uh, great thanks to your great presentation today. It was a pleasure to, to talk and uh, discuss with you those questions. Uh, thank you, all our listeners. Sorry for the technical problems in the beginning. Yeah. Thank you for your patience and a big applause also to Andres from our side.